All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this, for Black Hat relatively early hour and for making the long journey down unmarked hallways and having the dedication to actually find the room. So my name is Brad Hill. I'm a principal consultant with ISEC Partners. My name is uh, Scott Stender. I'm a uh, partner at ISEC Partners. Uh, my name is Rachel Engel. I'm a security analyst at ISEC Partners. And we all work in their application security consulting practice and the three of us are based out of Seattle. So we're here this morning to talk about attacking Kerberos deployments. Um, Kerberos is one of the oldest security protocols that's still in wide use. Um, and as for any protocol that is of that age and that level of complexity in deployment, there are lots of caveats, warnings, configurations, and um, notes in RFCs and policy statements and operating systems for configuring it. And these tend to be kind of cryptic and hard to understand, so much so that just about every deployment we've ever looked at has at least some set of services that are not taking advantage of the full set of security properties available of Kerberos or are configured in ways that are just wildly insecure, unfortunately. So we're here to, uh, we read the RFCs so you don't have to and read the policies so you don't have to and we're gonna explain to you what do those warnings actually mean in terms of practical attacks and what can you do as developers and as administrators of these systems to make your uh, lives more secure when you're using Kerberos. So we're going to start today on our agenda with a quick overview of the protocol. Um, so those of you who don't live in the jargon every day like us will have some idea what we're talking about when it starts to fly. Um, we're going to talk about the initial authentication steps of Kerberos and some attacks against uh, ETEC negotiation. We're going to go into public key Kerberos as it supports um, smart card login and look at an attack there that is active against just about every single Active Directory system deployed in the field today that allows user to user elevation or privilege. Um, and owning one box eventually elevating to owning an entire enterprise. And then we're going to look at the uh, establishment of sessions to applications with Kerberos and how those might be hijacked and what are some of the precautions that we can take to uh, protect against replays and ensure that we're talking to the services we really think we are. So a very brief introduction to Kerberos. Kerberos is a trusted third party symmetric key exchange protocol based on the Needham Schrader protocol from 1978 and then formalized over several versions into the current form of Kerberos 5 today. But the basics are still the same. You have a trusted third party, the KDC, which is the key distribution center, and it has a shared secret with everyone else in, that participates in Kerberos. And that's a set of uh, principles for which the KDC has shared keys is called the realm. So here we see a KDC has a um, shared secret with a client and with a file server. And our scenario is the client wants to talk to and establish a secure connection and authenticate itself to the file server. So the client begins that by talking to the KDC. Um, it uses its long-term shared secret, usually a password, to make an authentication service request to the KDC. And the KDC replies, again verifying with that same long-term shared secret, and it issues the client a new short-term key. This is key associated with a ticket granting ticket. So we don't want to continue to expose that long-term key on the network many times, so we create a new short-term key. And the client uses that short-term key to make a request for service to the file server. KDC replies using the short-term key, and it creates a session key to be shared between the client and the file server. It gives one copy in a form that the client can read and gives another copy encrypted so that only the server can read it. The client can then form a service request to the file server, can authenticate it with that short-term key, and then it sends the server um, its copy of the key encrypted so that only the server can read it. Server unwraps the key, verifies the signature on the message that came from the same key, and then it can provide services to the client, optionally verified and signed and sealed, whatever, with that uh, short-term session key. So these are the basics. And why you should care is because this stuff is everywhere. If you've ever logged on to a Windows Active Directory network, if you've participated in a large-scale Unix Linux deployment on a university or any other type system where you have a large centrally administered intranet network, Kerberos is the underlying protocol for all of that. And it's not just there. Um, because it is so widely deployed, it's uh, being adopted continually in new places. Um, one of our other consultants, Andrew Becker, is going to talk about Kerberos and Hadoop later on in the conference. It's being used for web services. It's being used for InfoCard and federated services as a binding to allow internet identities to be moved out to the um, web. And uh, so it really is the sort of hidden glue that holds all of our security together in an enterprise environment and extending out to the web. We're going to start at the beginning. 
uh, with our advice and look at the initial authentication and how that is uh, set up and I'm going to hand it over to Scott Stender to do that portion. Well, thank you, Brad. So one of the main drivers for Kerberos V5 was that Kerberos V4 did not have cryptographic agility. All symmetric keys, all encryption that happened in the Kerberos V4 protocol used the DES encryption algorithm, which we all know if we've been paying attention to security in the last few years, it's not sufficient to protect traffic today. So in Kerberos V5, you introduce the ability to negotiate which cryptographic primitives, you know, encryption algorithms, hashing algorithms, and whatnot, uh, and whatnot to use for protecting different, uh, different Kerberos message exchanges. Examples of uh, what I'll call, what are called encryption types, I'll call them E-types during this talk for short. Examples of E-types include AES-256 and ciphertext sealing mode with an HMAC that uses SHA-1 as a hashing algorithm and so on. So you have AES-128, RC-4 HMAC which is actually uh, something that came from Windows, it was introduced with Windows 2000, it's not a standard but you can find guidance on how it's implemented uh, and that uses a 128-bit RC-4 key. Uh, you have DES CBC MD5 and RC4 HMAC, similar to RC4 HMAC 128, uh, except for it's uh, truncated to a 56 bit key. So, how are E types negotiated? Now, uh, you just, Brad just went through the whole protocol. I'm going to focus on the AS REC exchange. Now, there is no specific standard for negotiating E types. And at best, you could call them ad hoc standards, but clients and servers are free to do more than having a standard you know, negotiation stage. But what you'll see most often is if you're looking at uh, network trace is a, uh, a couple of attempts to authenticate where the negotiation happens through those attempts and error messages that are returned. So the first stage you'll have the client send what I'll call an anonymous AS rec. Uh, the uh, AS rec is authenticated using a structure called the INC timestamp. That's just a timestamp that's ASIN1 encoded, a little bit more data that's uh, encrypted using a key derived from the user's password. So at first they do an anonymous AS uh, rec which is, you know, NC type stamp is null and then it has a list of E types that the client supports. Hello, I support AES-256 and DES CBC MD5. The server responds with an error pre-auth required. I'm not going to just give you message, you know, data that's encrypted with the user's key. If you're just anybody on the, on the, on the network, I want you to prove to me first who you are, then I'll happily send you back a little bit of information. In that message you have a list of E types. So it says air pre -off required, by the way, of the messages, all of, of the E types you sent me, I support these two, AES-256 and DES CBC. So the server responds with the union of it, what it supports and the set of what the client supports. The client chooses the best of them, the strongest of them. In this case, without any kind of interaction, it'll choose AES-256 and it will use that to, it will, you know, use the standard derivation algorithm for going from password to key. It will use that to encrypt the timestamp, send that up to the server, and it will specify, you know, hey, I'm, this is a big blob, 6BA4 dot dot dot, and it's using AES-256, and then it also includes a list of E-types to be used for negotiating the TGS key, which is the next stage. The server responds with a uh, AS rep which includes the key that is to be used for a TGS request that followed, the authenticator for that. So attacking E-type negotiation. Now it's not exactly apparent if you read the, you know, the specifications, the RFCs and whatnot, and it's not really apparent if you look at the network traffic. And also if you've had experience with other similar protocols that have to negotiate cryptographic primitives, you might be surprised to find that that list of E-types, both from the server and the client, is unprotected by any kind of integrity mechanism. Uh, right now it's all pre-auth and so it ha the attacker has the ability to drop good E-types and leave bad ones behind. So what does this allow us to do? It allows the, the attacker to, a full man in the middle attacker, to drop the good E-types when the client is sending that, an, that initial uh, anonymous AS rec. The Kerberos server will then respond back with that air pre-auth required message that includes only what the client supports and that it supports as well. So if you just say, hello, I support only DES, server will look up and say, do I support DES? Yeah, great, okay, here, you know, let's go with the DES. You can also downgrade the authenticated AS rec, in which case you're going to influence the next stage. Or you can, uh, you can uh, intercept the server response back to the client, that air pre-auth required message, and you can downgrade and lie to the client about what the server supports. In both cases, uh, the end result is the, uh, the same. The INC timestamp, that authenticator, that which is derived directly from the user's password, is going to be using a cryptographic method that's not exactly the most secure thing in the world. 
Now the benefits of that. So if I am able to downgrade to DES, DES is a rather older and somewhat simpler E-type than the latest and greatest. There is no keyed authenticator within the encrypted timestamp. Furthermore, the only key that's derived is the encryption key that is used to protect that encrypted timestamp. So what you have is a one time take this string, make it into a password, that or into a key, and that key remains the same key that's always used to encrypt AS rec inc timestamps from now until the user changes their password at the same time. In effect, if you see if you get that key, you're able to have a password equivalent for Kerberos and use that for several months until they change your password once again. So the end attack the end to end attack scenario is you know get active man in the middle on a you know network that uses Kerberos, downgrade that initial AS rec or the response to error pre op required, um, go down to DES, you're going to see the client emit that encrypted timestamp and then you can hand it off to our friends who are also at this conference, Pico Computing. Here you see a, uh, a card that is an FPGA cluster. Back at Black Hat Federal, they demonstrated breaking a DES key in as little as three days using older hardware. Uh, presumably with more hardware and this newer hardware, we could break that down into shorter number of days or even hours. Uh, we can go ask them if we need details on that. So you break the key, now you have that long term key and then you can just go back to the network and use that to authenticate the user and get access to any system that they have access to via Kerberos. All right, so we all know DES is bad. How do we, um, is that the only thing that can go wrong? The other benefit of downgrade is that, again, the latest and greatest E types are a bit more sophisticated in trying to protect against password grinding attacks. And by that I mean we take a big dictionary of words, we, we do the uh, derivation of keys, we encrypt a timestamp and verify and see if the um, if the encrypted timestamp can be decrypted using something that would be out of a dictionary. And we can, you know, spend a whole lot of time verifying what, uh, you know, trying active keys, seeing what's going on, seeing if we can guess the user's password. Um, Franco Dwyer several years ago, uh, maybe 2002, 2005, I think he had an update to his paper, demonstrated that you can have efficient password grinding attacks against a strong E-type that's used widely in Windows, RC4128 HMAC. Um, if you, even if uh, you do get rid of DES and you use only uh, E-types that cannot be broken b via you know, exhaustive exploration of the key space, you can downgrade to something that allows for efficient password grinding attacks. So for that reason we suggest staying with the latest and greatest uh, because they do try to slow that computation down using PBKDF2 which is a standard for repeatedly hashing the user's password and the output from the previous hash to make the computational difficulty of deriving a key much greater. Uh, you can specify, uh, you can configure the number of iterations. The standard specifies that you should not be able to go below a minimum iteration count. Uh, the default is 4096, by the way. Uh, the, um, but the interesting thing about downgrading is not only can you say go back to RC4 HMAC, you can take advantage of uh, any bad client implementation in that you can specify in that error pre-auth required um, optional parameters for the key derivation. You can specify the salt that is to be used which is typically the user, the user's full name, it's the realm and the user's name. Um, or you can specify the number of iteration counts. And so if you have some, if you, you can use that wiggle room to perhaps make a more efficient attack. So does this affect me? You know, we talked about DES, we all know that DES is terrible. Uh, Windows Server 2008 and Windows Vista, so the latest versions of Windows from just a few years ago, all support DES out of the box. And so the KDCs are willing to accept DES encrypted at timestamps and Windows Vista clients are willing to emit them. Um, in addition, rather recent open source distributions of Kerberos, MIT, Heimdall, and uh, similar ones that are configured and used similarly, uh, Solaris for example, uh, they also all support DES. Um, Windows 7 emits but does not accept RC4, or export grade RC4. You can have a Windows 7 client emit a 56 bit encrypted timestamp doesn't do you a whole lot of good because it doesn't help you get the password any faster than that R128 version. Um, similarly, the client or the uh, DC will not accept that authenticator as proper authentication. Um, and also, even if you get through a bit of all that, if you have the latest and greatest where everything is disabled by default or you can configure it as much, um, enabling DES E types is still surprisingly required for interoperability. If you go and look around for guidance on configuring E types in Windows Server 2008 R2, you're much more likely to find people looking for the KB to fix a patch that allow them to, uh, or fix their servers that allow them to use DES in certain circumstances. People require DES for older systems, and especially even as recently as right before Windows Vista was released, DES was the only common ground that MIT Curb and Windows Curb had for negotiating E types. So you have it still out there for interoperability. That's why it's enabled a lot of times, and that's why it's still enableable, even though we know it's all terrible. So protecting against downgrade, in a word,